Hello and welcome to Tech for Non-Techies, the only podcast that demystifies the fast-growing technology sector. I'm your host, Sophia Madriera, Chicago Beef MBA and tech entrepreneur. My aim here is to give you the skills, knowledge and confidence to find opportunities in the tech sector, whether that's through founding a company, getting a dream job or bringing a fresh perspective to your work. Hello there. This episode is all about technical co-founders. Do you need them? If you need them, how do you find them? And how do you work with them effectively? I discussed these topics with Andrew Ackerman. Andrew is a serial entrepreneur and he's currently the managing director of DreamIt and that's one of the top accelerators in New York City. This episode is an excerpt of a live session that Andrew did for Tech Fun and Techies members. Enjoy. So I started off, um, you know, kind of boring consulting for Fortune 100 companies for a couple of years. And then the internet started exploding in a good way, uh, but not where I was. So I moved back to New York. Uh, and after a brief stint at a large company, like less than a year, I was in my first startup. Uh, it was a startup that, uh, at what we would call now SaaS for summer camps. Uh, it was all about the experience of camp parents when their kids were away. So photos and one-way email systems and all that fun stuff. Super revolutionary for 1999, 2000. Now it's like, really? People paid for that? I'm like, yeah, they did. Um, did that for eight years, then I got bought out. Uh, spent a little bit of time on the other side of the table as a uh, running a family office. So I was oh, sorry, investing... Just- who, um, you, you just mentioned, oh, I just got bought out. Like it's, a, you know, like it's an easy thing to do. So congratulations. And um, who bought yeah. the company? Ah, so it's actually quite interesting. Um, the shorter version of the story is that we had put the company up there. We were either going to raise money or sell it. Uh, and then the, um, the offer that we got, I thought was quite reasonable. Uh, the CEO did not. So I went to the CEO and I said, listen, if that's, too little for you to sell the company for, you should be thrilled to buy me out at that price. And I'm leaving anyway, because it's been enough time for me. So we negotiated that I would stay on for uh, about a year, find a successor, train him up. Uh, We were seasonal business, so we had to go through the summer for the obvious reasons. Uh, And then we parted uh, amicably. Company was acquired, uh, I think in 2016, and at first it was part cash, part stock. So it was acquired for what I thought was a lower value than I got out at. And then ultimately the company that acquired it got acquired and some of the stock was worth more. But net net, I got out um, for almost the same amount eight years before the company exited. Um, we could probably do a, an entire talk about trying to exit the company when oh, you're you not a CEO. <laughs> uh, we can try. It's a tough one. When you're it's not, not today. Well, on the shot, it's a little hard. In fact, I wrote a blog post about it uh, a bunch of years back. Cool. So, um, sorry, I, I interrupted you, but it was just too interesting uh, not to. I, I'm a New Yorker. I'm an active listener, so anyone else can jump in, too. We're good that way. Um, so, family office, for those of you that aren't familiar, it's a private individual or a family that's got a ton of money and needs people in-house to help them manage it, and in some cases, donate it. Uh, You know, my guy was all about investing the money, not so much into donating it. Uh, And it was split between big, boring private equity funds all the way down to, and hedge funds all the way down to VC and and one-off investments in startups. So I ran that for about three years. uh, And then I got out and did another startup. uh, That was, I was also bought out of that one. That one was not as good a story. What was the second one? Uh, The second one had to do with, digital memories, for lack of a better word. So like a large part of what had happened at Bunk One was the photos that were taken of kids at camp and how they, you know, how parents would access them. So we were thinking a bit more broadly about all the photos, all the written communication, even audio clips uh, that formed your memories uh, and how since they were never curated, they weren't accessible, it was as if you had not. So like the line I used to say is, You know, when I grew up, you had a couple of albums with photos. That's all you had, but you saw them regularly. And now we have 10,000 plus photos. We never look at them. So effectively, we have zero. An attempt to solve that problem was a B2C company. Uh, I was brought in by the idea founder 
who also funded it to help launch it. Uh, I recruited a team. We started programming on it. I was pre-selling it to the different uh, VC funds. Original founders like, oh, I can take it from here. I said, with respect, I don't think you can. Uh, but at that point, you know, kind of big lesson number one, the moment the, uh, the team dynamics break down, right, you got to decide is it salvageable or not. And in that case, it wasn't. So we ultimately agreed to part ways. He bought me out. Uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, there's a saying, you know, you could be rich or you could be right. In this case, I was right. Uh, would have much rather been wrong and rich, though. But uh, that, was a, that was my second startup. And in many ways, I learned more from that one than my first. So after that, I was well on my way to do a third startup. Uh, I was doing some angel investing on my own, and then I ended up uh, joining Dreamit. So Dreamit, uh, at the time, for anyone out there not familiar with it, was uh, one of the premier pre-seed accelerator programs in the world. It was the third oldest after Techstars and Y Combinator. I was brought in to run their New York office. At that point, it was you know, early stage, you know, minimum viable product, no revenue st startups uh, that were ultimately going to go raise their seed round. And we were generalists. About three years ago, we switched focus. Now we deal with somewhat later stage startups. They're usually post-revenue, uh, 100000 to a $1 million in revenue is kind of our sweet spot. We're focused on three main industry verticals, uh, health tech. So not life sci or pharma, but things like enterprise software for large hospitals or insurers, some med devices. Uh, we do secure tech, so it's physical and cyber security solutions. And the group that I run is urban tech, so that's prop tech or real estate tech and construction tech. Uh, not really many smart cities. Uh, we pretty much focus on the private sector uh, stuff. And I've been doing that ever since. Uh, actually, that's strictly not true. We, I also launched an ed tech program, which we don't recruit for anymore. I was actually just on a call with one of our alumni of that program. Uh, but no, now we're, we're just the three verticals I mentioned. And also, by far the most important thing is you have an MBA from Chicago Booth. Uh, that is true, uh, though I got it before it was called Booth, so that makes me old. So I, you know, I'm pretty process oriented. I was a COO and, and the head of product, so I would come out with like the, the flow that I wanted, the UI and the UX for new features. And then we'd ask for things. And I always say like, oh, it's one, I need you to add a button here. Like that's four weeks. Mm -hmm. There's one button. Why is it four weeks? So I got tired of asking that. And I said, you know what? Sit me down. I got a little bit of time right now. It's not our busy season. Talk me through why this is hard. So I understand and I know what to ask for. Uh, and that got me to understand like, uh, you know, the information architecture of a site, how relational databases are joined, how the how the data schema matters, and how choices you make early can impact you later on. Uh, and at first, the you know my my co-founders you know were thrilled. Like finally, somebody took the time to understand like you know what was being asked, and then they got kind of annoyed because then I would say like okay, this should, this should take only about a week, right? And they're like, no, it's going to take four weeks. So it's only going to take four weeks if you fucked up the setup, right? If you cut corners the first time around, they're like, yeah, we were in a rush. Uh, so, but it was useful, right? So, uh, and the other stuff that I did also, in addition to making me a better um, partner uh, for my technical colleagues, I also did it. A little bit because um, it's a good show of respect, right? So it's like I can speak basic Japanese. I took that in business school, right? Um, I cannot get by all day in, in Japanese. I, I'm totally not competent that way. But I show up at a meeting. I can exchange a few pleasantries that way. Uh, expectations are very low of Westerners there. So the fact that I've taken the time to learn as, as much as I did it's a show of respect. So in part, I did JavaScript because I was curious. I thought it would make me a better manager. Not so much, right? The, I kind of had a lot of that as well. But then a lot of times like I got tell people about it. I'll show them stuff that I did. Uh, and it's actually open doors because, you know, now they're like, oh, you know, here's a guy that's willing to meet me halfway, not just want to wave a, a magic wand. So it's more of a show of respect. Uh, and if you can do it for both reasons, I would urge it. Um, now that I'm on the other side of the table as an investor, um, I feel very strongly about having a team that has both a technical co-founder on board 
and a domain expertise, a domain expert in that industry. Uh, there's the rare exceptions to that rule, but uh, you know, I, I would almost always insist on that as part of an investment. And why is that? Why why does a why does somebody who has uh, great domain expertise and all the kind of business network and a decent idea, why do they need somebody who's a co-founder? Uh, like at that level. So there are um, there are a bunch of reasons, right? So number one, there's the whole, like I'm a solo founder. Like mm -hmm. it is way, way, way too hard. There's too much work to go around for it to be one person. And if it's all in your head, everything sounds great. You, know, you need to be able to bounce it off other people. They need to break your idea. Then you need to make sure that you can communicate it effectively. Like I personally don't believe you have a well thought out idea until you've tried to put pen to paper. Right, much less, but even the first pass, just being able to communicate it to someone clearly who isn't inside your own head. So from one to two is a huge quantum leap uh, forward in terms of your ability to execute. Now, why specifically a technical co-founder? So the, the counter argument is, well, I'll just you know, hire an outsourced dev shop. Mm -hmm. So whenever you as a non-technical co-founder hire an outsourced dev shop, A, you usually don't know what the hell they do. So you don't know how to specify what you want in ways that aren't going to bite you in the butt later. You don't know if you're being taken advantage. You don't know if they're setting things up properly. But what's more, what's more is um, you have the wrong mentality, right? So let me, let me break that down for you. Whenever you want to add a feature, if you're paying by the hour, your question will always be, hmm, is it worth X dollars to add this feature? And that's a recipe to go slow and not add features. If you have a technical co-founder, even if you're doing some outsourced dev at the same time, but if you have a technical co-founder that's doing the bulk of the work, then your mentality is, um, okay, I, like, I'm at this all-you-can-eat salad bar, but I can only fill my plate so high. So what am I going to put on my plate? What's the most important thing to do? So then your decision is, we have all these potential features we could build. What's the one that's the best combination of time to develop and bang for our time? And that's a much better decision to make because there you're prioritizing, you're moving forward. Uh, and then as you raise, you're like, well, I can, act, I can expand my, my pipeline, my ability to develop these things in exchange for something else. So it's a much healthier, much faster set of decisions when you've got your tech person in house and you're thinking about it in terms of, okay, I have these resources available. What's the best use of that resource? Well, you mentioned trust and you mentioned understanding. So, you know, if you are just there by yourself, you don't know anything about technology and then you hire a development shop, then because of your lack of understanding, uh, it's kind of almost natural that there's going to be maybe some suspicion, some, some trust issues. But couldn't you then also have exactly the same issues with your technical co-founder? So it's a little different, right? So your technical co-founder isn't charging you by the hour. But they're charging you an equity. Uh, yeah, but it's the same amount. It's, it's like I paid up front, right? So if you've chosen your technical co-founder well, right? And I'm saying that even if you chose your dev shop well, it's a problem. I'm saying if you will assume that you've chosen wisely in both cases, right? Now you've got a guy or a woman uh, who is... If the site doesn't work at 3 a.m., he or she gets up sweating bullets to fix it, right? When you're sitting down, if it's a true co-founder, you're sitting down trying to lay out your priorities business-wise for the next quarter or year, you've got someone who will actively be bouncing off, well, I think this is the best use of our time, the best bang for our buck. If you ask a dev shop, I want you to build X, they'll tell you what it costs to build X. They're not going to come back and say, well, we can build Y or Z. You know, it'll cost you less. Do you want to do that? The incentives aren't there. Dev shops will build what you ask them to build. They have no incentive to tell you to build something else. Your, your co-founder has all those incentives. Well, I, I mean, I can share my experience because I actually had that experience with the development shop telling me, don't build this. But I also did have a technical co-founder who was overseeing them. So I think, you know, it also matters who you work with and how your setup is. Uh, but also, I think I got very, very lucky with the people I've been working with. But there was also some oversight. I think 
There so was a tech co-founder who monitors outsourcing can work for a couple of reasons, right? It's a little bit like, you know, a lot of large corporations have lawyers in-house who oversee the counsel that they bring in for, spe for specific cases. You know, if you were just bringing in the lawyers without anyone in-house, you have no idea. Like, there's nobody there that speaks their language. There's no one there that can, you know, ask, is this really necessary? So having a tech co-founder in-house who manages them makes sure that, uh, A, they're being efficient and they're developing it the way that is consistent with your long-term vision, right? There's no way you're going to transmit your long-term vision to a dev shop. And even if you did to the owner of the dev shop, there's no way that trickles down to the people actually coding, right? So that's, that's the, um, the tech guy needs to be on top of that and needs to fulfill that critical role. I would argue also that the nature of your business dictates how much you need to have in-house versus how much needs to be out. So if you have a startup that is not dependent on technical innovation for its uh, key differentiator, then you may be able to get away with more of it being outsourced. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're creating a, a new direct-to-consumer, I don't know, jewelry brand, right? Or, you know, linens with the highest thread count made from bamboo, right? So th that's a better example. So then the innovation there is on the product side, the nature of the product. Maybe you have some defensibility about your production techniques. The building of an e-commerce website to sell that is technically trivial. Right, the skills that you need are on the product side and also on direct marketing, uh, maybe search engine marketing or or social marketing, whatever that channel is. But the ability to build the site with a shopping cart and take orders, that is at this point in our in our development trivial. So you don't need tech in house for that. You might not need tech at all. Right? You need a developer, a designer to like you know, take photos and put it up. But you can go take um, any one of half a dozen off the shelf solutions. So if you're on that end of the spectrum, then yeah, you know, you don't really need a tech co-founder. Uh, I would argue that the equivalent there is if you know product, you need someone who knows marketing. That would be the yin for your yang. But that's also not the kind of startups that I generally invest in. So now that um, we've established your view on why you need them, I've been asked a lot about how do you find them? And my experience was there was... There was luck, but as I was saying in our uh, newsletter, I think some of you read it on Monday, that I think you can, to an extent, create your own luck. Because if you're creating, you know, you've got to be out there. You can't just sort of sit there and pray for something good to happen. I mean, do that, but, you know, prayers with action. Yeah, yeah. Um, people don't come to you, to be really honest, right? So the analogy I like to give sometimes, and it's a little not PC, but uh, I want the, the business side of the equation to, to kind of absorb a little bit of humility here. Um, the technical co-founders are like the really attractive women in a bar. And the business co-founders are kind of like that dorky middle-aged guy wearing khakis. Um, that's really how you got to think about it. And the reason for that is um, for the early stages in what you're building, the tech co-founders can be doing a lot of the work. And the perception on their side is that you're not doing that much. But hey, you just had the idea. I got to run it. And many of them have been burnt in the past. Many of them have been burnt. They've gone out there. They've put like four months of their lives, nights and weekends, coming up with an MVP of the product or an alpha of the product. And then they like, there you go. And then the business person kind of just drops it, right? Won't quit his or her day job, uh, incapable of getting customers, incapable of getting investors, and then, you know, the tech co-founder just wasted a bunch of the time. So they've kind of been burnt before. And, and there's so many more business founders trying to woo them away that they can afford to be selective and they should be selective. They absolutely should be. So how do you convince a tech co-founder? Well, first, let's go with how you find them. And then we'll talk about how you convince them to take it. Actually, so, can you just backtrack and talk about what is a good te technical co-founder? Um, okay, so there's a couple of things. What makes a good tech co-founder depends on the kind of business you're running, right? The business, if it's like super hardcore, natural language processing, artificial intelligence, you need an A-plus team with that. And you can get some, uh, some 
comfort level as to who the person is you're talking to by looking at their professional resume, like what have they taken course wise is in some cases there are professional certifications. Microsoft is a bunch of them. Because you know, if you're a non techie, how do you know? I, mean, I, would, I would look at their LinkedIn profile. Oh, hey, where have you worked before? Oh, you did this for you know Google. What kind of projects were you working on with Google? Yeah, right. So what what what's good basically? Because you know, uh, well, again, you're not going to like this because I can keep repeating it. It depends on the startup. So let's actually unpack that a little bit, right? I gave the example if you're making like you know pillowcases with high thread counts made of bamboo material, like. What do you need? You don't need, you need a website. You don't even need a, a high hardcore tech co-founder, right? As you move up the chain and you understand what your startup does, you should get a sense of like what the technical challenges are, right? In some cases, you're like, oh, it's going to be AI, but you dig into it. It's really just a database table. Like you could put it together in Excel if you needed to. So you need people with those skill sets. But if it's really taking like free form information, like someone types in like, my toilet's not working and you need a chat bot that's able to translate that into a series of questions to figure out what's wrong with it, then you're going to need other skill sets. So as a uh, non-technical co-founder, it's on you to get educated into what that means technically, right? You need to go out there and understand that if you're asking someone, you're asking if your business model relies on the customer being able to put in just free form text or even voice and the machine figuring it out, you have to get on yourself to know that that's natural language processing and LP, right? Uh, if you think it has to be blockchain based, you really have to understand what blockchain is and understand whether or not it's really necessary. Like, do you need a ledgerless ledger or is a perfectly good centralized ledger good? Right? So it's on you to understand the technologies uh, that apply to your business at a high enough level to know checklist or bullet points. What do I need? Once you have that, um, and you can get some of that by looking at similar businesses or different businesses and you know different industries with similar approaches. Um, you'll get a sense of when you're talking to a tech co-founder where you want to probe. It's like, oh, okay, you worked for Google. What did you do for Google? Oh, you worked in search. Oh, okay. So in search, you know, some of the long form searches were, you know, the equivalent of natural language processing, right? Or maybe they did translations or maybe they did speech to text. Like you need to understand what those bullets are and then you can ask about that and you can get a sense of whether they've done it often from their LinkedIn profile, if they're put together or even just from like what they've worked on. Um, understanding what tech your company needs, where what's critical for it also helps you and where you'll meet these programmers, right? So there are often a bunch of meetups on the tech side, for instance, uh, or different events and co or conferences or you name it that are appealing to developers of different types, right? So if you're convinced that you need blockchain for your startup, there are blockchain conferences, right? You'll go to them. Before you go to them, you'll kind of get a sense of who's going there. Are there startups? There are there developers there? Uh, and there may be job fairs. Who knows? But you'll get a sense of what you need. You'll look at the different venues. And you'll ask yourself, what are the odds that the kind of developer I need is going to be going to this? And you'll take it a step back. If I were the kind of developer I needed, what would be attractive about this conference to me? Right? What would I, would I use my time on this? And you'll go to it. I went to a lot of Android developing meetups when I needed to recruit uh, a co-founder for my second startup, technical co-founder. Right? And they were super technical. I'm sitting there like taking notes. Like, I got to Google this later. But hey, I learned a lot about how Android app development worked. And I met a technical co-founder. I think I met through one of those. Maybe not. I met a bunch of people who were potential tech co-founders for certain. I don't know if Carmen came from that, those types of events. But you so got to go there. What I'm seeing in this as well um, is that in order for you as a non-technical founder to go about doing this, you actually really need to understand what it is that you're building, uh, what it is that you're doing. So you need to have a, not only do you, have just a general idea, but you actually need to really do some thinking about what you're going to be building, what it's going to look like, potentially maybe some market validation. So you you have to be pretty pretty crystal, crystal clear about the proposition, mm -hmm. which then means only then can you think of okay, this is this is the kind of person 
that I would need to help me create. Yeah. So right? with my yeah with with my startups, the ones that I've done personally and the and the people that I, I you know that I advise, you know, again, most of the companies I'm working with now are later stage. They figured this out. When people ask me, oh, I have an idea. If I can't run away fast enough and I have to give them advice, uh, or if they know me socially, uh, I'll sit down and I'll say, okay, you need to be able to flesh out your idea in enough detail that you understand who's going to pay for it. You understand why they're going to pay for it, why there's a need. You know the competition well enough that you know that you're quantum level better. And all that stuff you're going to need when you sell your idea to a technical co-founder anyway, because that is, in many respects, your first sale. Well, right? it's interesting, right? Uh, well, they're investing their time, right? And which is another reason why a tech co-founder for a business that matters, if they don't have it, like I'm like, that's your first sale. Prove to me you can make it, right? Um, so anyway, you need to understand that, and then you need to drill down a little bit. So what I do for all my startups, once I understand exactly where the value props are, I'll start off with feature lists, right? Every feature has a benefit associated with it. So I'll start with the feature list, how I think it works. And I'll break them down into as granular pieces as possible. And then I'll really rigorously go through that list and I will put red lines through all of them that I don't think are absolutely necessary to launch. Like what is version 1.0? What's my minimum viable product? I'll even put 2.0 and 3.0 or, or later against the other features, right? I do that because I wanna make sure I'm being brutally efficient, right? Then once you understand what those features are at different levels, you can go in and figure out what technology makes the most sense. But here's the, here's the beauty, right? When I go in there and I talk to a tech co-founder, I'm like, hey, here's my broad vision. This is what it's going to do. Here are the things that I think are right now minimum versus the other stuff. What he or she is hearing is like, okay, here's a person that like, A, is taking enough time to understand tech, so I respect that, and he respects me. B, has taken enough time to think through the development pipeline in enough detail that they are really being careful with my time. They are treating my time like the valuable resource that it is, not just like an all-you-can-eat buffet. If you want to hear the rest of the session where Andrea and I talk about how to convince this technical co-founder to join you, so things like what kind of equity split you should have and when they should quit their job and go full-time and when you should quit your job and go full-time, then join Tech One on Techies membership where you'll be able to see the entire session. The link for the membership is in the show notes. This podcast is going to be taking a break until September because I'm taking a break because it's August. So I'll be back with you in your ears in the first week of September. In the meantime, have a fabulous, fabulous summer break. Speak soon.